if I were pressed hard, do I predict that Putin is going to disrupt our electoral voting counting procedures? My guess is not. Hi everyone, Ian Bremmer here and welcome to your G Zero world. Today we've got Mike McFall, Stanford University professor, former US ambassador to Russia. Great time to be talking to him. We're gonna be talking about the Mueller investigations, an expanding war in Syria, all sorts of transitions in Africa, and I got your puppet regime. But first, to Syria. Used to have a civil war in Syria, now we have a war over Syria. Frankly, it's a lot more dangerous now. We don't have hundreds of thousands of refugees streaming into Turkey and Europe, but we do have some of the world's most important military powers all fighting each other. Uh, the two most important headlines I'd focus on first, the United States actually killed, killed over 200 Russian fighters in Syria. They attacked an American base. The Iranians have already said the Americans have to get out. The Americans beat them back, and the interesting thing is neither Trump or Putin are saying a damn thing about it. They really want to work together. Second big issue, Israel. An Iranian drone flies into Israeli territory. They knock it down, they go and bomb a bunch of Syrians, also hit a bunch of Iranians, and an Israeli plane goes down. Thankfully, in Israel, if it had gone down in Syria, uh, that's a pilot that probably would be a hostage right now, and it would have expanded greatly. Instead, we have a war of words. The Iranians saying that they're going to hit Israel. The Israelis saying that the Iranians are not allowed to have a permanent presence in Syria. Let's be very clear. This is becoming a lot more dangerous. Delighted that ISIS no longer has a caliphate in Syria, but that was a much smaller threat uh, than the world's major military powers facing off against each other, none of whom have an effective endgame in what's now the world's most dangerous war. Next to Africa. A lot of transitions. First, we had Mugabe gone the end of last year in Zimbabwe. Good riddance. Now we've got Zuma out. No more ANC for him, no more South African president. We've got Cyril Ramaphosa. He is a much better story for a country that really needs improved governance. Now we have the Ethiopian prime minister, Desalen, also out, not representative. Do these stories have anything in common? Yes, they do. They have a lot of corruption and they have a lot of people inside their countries that were getting sick of it and becoming restive. They also have judiciaries that are increasingly, in the case of South Africa and Ethiopia, willing to rule against that corruption. That's a good story. It's been a long time since we've had trends across the African continent moving towards supporting the people. I wish all the news was good. One big piece we're concerned about, it's the Democratic Republic of Congo. And Mr. Kabila, longstanding president, he's done. His term was over in December. It's February now. He's still there. Uh, lots of social unrest. The military is being tougher and cracking down. And if we end up in another war there, we've got a couple hundred million Africans in neighboring countries that are going to be doing worse as well. More forced migration, another lousy story coming out of Africa. And finally, 13 more indictments coming down from Robert Mueller in his investigation against the Trump administration, not against Americans. This was against Russians, Russians that were directly involved in undermining the election of the United States. Now look, Americans have been involved in undermining elections all over the world, including in Russia, though those aren't democratic, let's be clear. But in this case, Trump is gonna have to start taking a tougher line on the Russians, and that's what he's saying. He's now saying Obama, not his hard line. In fact, a series of tweets over the course of the weekend talking about just how unhappy he is with the investigation, of course, the fake news, Congress, kind of you name it. Look, the story is that Obama was commander in chief when the Russians started hacking into the American elections. And there are plenty of reasons why he didn't want to respond very strongly to it. He thought Hillary was gonna win anyway, and so she'd be able to take uh, the initiative once she was there, concerned about his leg legacy. Uh, he had a Republican leadership that wasn't willing to cooperate and make it bipartisan, but you know what? He still the president. He's commander in chief. It's American national security. He's the one that has to respond and he didn't. But Trump now saying 
that he's tougher on Russia than Obama. That's clearly not true. It's Trump personally that's been enormously frustrated that Congress, the media, others are all trying to make him have a harder relationship towards Russia while he wants to work more closely with Putin because shouldn't he have a good relationship with everybody? Well, in this case, the answer is no. If America is getting hacked, the world's only superpower needs to be able to hit back, especially because we've now had well over a year to figure out what kind of policy we designed to hit him. Haven't had one. Well, maybe eventually we'll have a commander in chief who knows how to do this. For now, we've got a couple that don't. And finally, it's puppet regime. Mr. Trump, you claim it's not actually your voice on the infamous Access Hollywood tape. Well, clearly you have not seen the enhanced tape, Ian, which people are saying is just very, very enhanced. And so I'll, I'll just show you if you don't mind. I moved on her uh, actually uh, heavily, uh, like a bitch. That's huge news right there, dude. Would you like a Tic Tac? Yes, thank you, because, you know, I'm automatically um, attracted to beautiful. I just start meddling in them. It is uh, like a magnet. I know what you mean. Uh, and when you are president of Russia, they just let you do it. You can they do, do anything. They totally uh, Because do. they will blame you anyway. You can do anything. It's uh... So you see, Ian, as I said, not my voice. Wait. So is this yet another undisclosed meeting with Putin? Public regime! But if one was doing political forecasting, I don't see any change. Yeah. And I'm here in Munich with Professor Mike McFall, Department of Political Science, Stanford University. Of course, before that, America's ambassador to the Russian Federation. Mike, wonderful to have you here on the G Zero. Thanks for having me. So Mike, US-Russia relations uh, today uh, are, Horrible. shall we say, not good. Yes. If you needed to make historical comparison, they're as bad as? You know, I just finished writing a book about this. It's called From Cold War to Hot Peace. That, that's uh, the earliest I've ever seen anyone try to plug a book. <laughs> well, I, you know. That's really astonishing, Mike. I, you asked. Yeah, that's okay, exactly yeah. what the book fair, is about. Fair enough. But that's, it's going to set up my answer, which is to say, you know, after the Soviet Union collapsed, yeah. and even earlier than that, right, the Gorbachev era, the Reagan era, uh, there was a feeling and I use the word feeling on purpose, in Washington, in Moscow, that Russia was, the Soviet Union, then Russia was entering the West, joining the liberal world order, uh, developing markets and democracy. And I think all the way through till about the time I arrived as ambassador, January 2012, ups and downs in that relationship. 20 down, years. 20 years. 20 sure. years, 25 yeah. years, depending on when you start counting. But, but that Democrats and Republicans, most certainly in the West, believe that that was still happening. And leaders in Russia, to varying degrees, also believed it was still happening. I think 2012 and then really 2014, when Russia invades Ukraine, is when that ends, that project ends. And Putin says earlier, you know, we don't need to be part of their clubs. We're going to have our own clubs. We're big enough power that we don't need to be part of the West. Now, is there, is there still that a, a significant level of cooperation between the Americans and Russians today in terms of counter-terrorist activities? Because certainly there, uh, the, those common interests should in principle exist. To the best of my knowledge, yes. Uh, but when I was in the government, I was in the government for five years, uh, first at the White House, then, then in Moscow with the Obama administration. Uh, of course we cooperated on counter-terrorism. Um, and because we have mutual interests and we have different capabilities, especially in terms of intelligence gathering. Now it's tricky. I think it's sometimes too easy to say, we all hate terrorists, let's fight terrorists together because their definition of a terrorist and our definition of a terrorist are not exactly the same. Well, indeed, our definition of terrorist, depending on who you're talking Correct. to, can vary. Changes, it, yes. it most certainly does vary. And even in my time in government, it varied. We had some arguments about who was a terrorist and not, for instance, in Syria. The United States and Russia are close to fighting each other directly yeah. in Syria right we, now. We may have killed some Russians in Syria, uh, yes. Apparently quite a few. Um, wh what's the threshold, in your view, uh, of conflict between the U.S. and Russia before it becomes something much less controllable? Well, Syria, even when I was in the government, we were always afraid of these scenarios because when you have American planes and Russian planes and now American soldiers and Russian soldiers fighting in the, in the same place with very blurry lines about who are good guys and who are bad guys, 
the potential for conflict is there, and it looks like tragically that happened. Uh, the good news is that the Russian soldiers, it sounds like, were contract, uh, so they were not part of the Russian command structure. And in, I've been very impressed by how cautiously Putin has been in talking about what happened. That's a, that's a good news. Uh, it's clear to me he does not want escalation with regard to this uh, particular instance. Having said that, uh, you know, uh, Secretary Tillerson actually was just out at Stanford a couple weeks ago uh, outlining their Syria policy. It was a major address, and he made pretty clear that, that we plan to be in Syria for a long time. We've just expanded. We've just expanded. Yeah. We're not going away. Uh, and I can tell you President Putin's not planning to go away either. Um, and that, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of these that thinks there'll be a spark there that will lead to some world war between the United States and Russia. That, that's just not going to happen. Uh, but the possibility of another fight, and, and, and if it's with, you know, uh, regular Russian soldiers, it takes on a much different dimension. So more like there. what happened when the Turks shot down a Russian plane. Yes. With major economic ramifications, diplomatic ramifications. Yeah. Sort of I mean, yes. I mean, the, the irony of that particular instance, right, was uh, Erdogan stood up to Putin and uh, after saying, stop doing this, they kept doing it and finally shot a plane down and things got really bad for a while. And now they're maybe better than they've ever been. Yeah, I've never seen a NATO ally with like uh, S-400s before. Not a good long-term development. How much of a threat to American national security do you think Russian cyber capabilities are? How much do you think they're actively trying, not just to get our information, but to damage the United States? So first of all, their capabilities are enormous, and I think a lot greater than most Americans know. Close to parity with the U.S.? Not parity, but but tremendous. And offense has always had a defense when it comes to cyber. Uh, and just technology has, has, has advanced, especially in, in, with respect to g gathering intelligence. Uh, quite extraordinary what they can do. And I used to live there, so I was surveilled 24-7. And uh, I probably shouldn't talk about exactly <laughs> all their capabilities. Uh, but they have a lot of Why don't you throw one? Throw one from your experience that you think people will be surprised by. So I lived in this beautiful uh, mansion. It's called Spasso House. Uh, your viewers should look it up. There's videos of it. Fantastic place. My entire house in Palo Alto could fit in the chandelier room of Spasso House, right? Um, and uh, there's something peculiar about the neighborhood, though. It's right downtown. Uh, there are a bunch of apartment uh, complexes that surround it. They have four rent signs in all the windows, and nobody ever moved in. Uh, the entire time we were there, nobody ever moved in. And there are all kinds of glass windows that can see right into your bedroom, right into your study, right into your living room. Uh, and just because of the vibration on the windows of people speaking, they can pick up everything you're saying. So uh, we had to learn as a family uh, to be uh, everything we said, Everything we did, yeah, your eyebrows are going up. Uh, everything we- I wasn't going there, my <laughs> Everything, <laughs> Everything that happens on a computer uh, or on a cell phone is surveilled. That, that technology is available and it's not just in Russia, they can do things in this country as well. But back to your hard question, yeah. which I kind of dodged. Um, so they have tremendous capability. If they wanted to disrupt markets or things like that, uh, they can do that right now. So sh shut down an American exchange. Shut down's a strong word, but create create ambiguity about the integrity of that information? Mm -hmm. That's a different thing? Mm -hmm. The answer to that is yes, right? You don't have to shut down things to make people nervous. Uh, and that's what scares me most about what they can do with our electoral machinery, right? So as we learned in 2016, uh, we learned a lot of things in terms of the, what they did in terms of stealing data and publishing it for political reasons. Uh, mixing up in our political debates through their various social media channels, uh, tweeting hashtag Crooked Hillary. Uh, that's a pretty uh, deliberate political statement. But what we also learned is that, you know, in two dozen states... And we know that was not just random Russians. We know that was linked to the Russian government. Yes. Hashtag Crooked Hillary was tweeted out by Sputnik. Uh, so they weren't being very... Owned uh, by the Russian owned government. Owned by the Russian government. So they were being pretty overt about it. 
Um, and, and there's a big normative debate that we haven't had uh, and uh, whether we should allow that or not, right? We don't allow Russians to give money to Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. That's against the law. Why do we allow them to give in-kind assistance uh, for elections? But the, the, the scariest part is that we also learned, and if we've learned it in the public, that means that those have read The Secret, uh, there's mo a lot more to this story. That's always, that's always my impression, having read the other side. Uh, we're only seeing a little bit. But they're on two dozen uh, computer systems, uh, voting registration, uh, uh, perhaps even uh, machines that count votes. Uh, they did not use that capability to disrupt the vote. That's the good news. And maybe we deterred them you know, in conversations that President Obama and President Putin had. But the capability is still there. If that would happen, God forbid, that would raise doubt about the integrity of our electoral process. Yeah. Now, I don't think they're going to do it. Everybody's talking 2018, you know, we just heard from a lot of intelligence agencies that they're messing around, and they are in terms of propaganda and in terms of media. Maybe we'll get to that in a minute. If I were pressed hard, do I predict that Putin is going to disrupt our electoral voting counting procedures? My guess is not. Uh, so many people talking about fake news now. And your view is that is exactly what Putin wants. To me, uh, especially their campaign in the United States on their various social media platforms, their bots and, uh, um, and their traditional media, which they also have, that's the, that's the goal. So it's not to convince you that Putin is a Democrat. It's to convince you that there are no Democrats. There's no difference between Putin's regime and our regime. It's all whataboutism. That's another thing that the, a very explicit strategy they have. So uh, there's no good and bad. Uh, they want you to be cynical about everything. And, you know, in my view, they've been rather successful. They've been successful in terms of supporting their own interests with their intervention in our elections. Because you look at Congress today. Yeah. Democrats and Republicans don't agree on much. They agree on Russia. Good point. Right? Really tough. I mean, did, was this a massive own goal by Putin? Well, I think it's mixed. So um, on the stirring up stuff so that we're fighting amongst ourselves, so that we're pulling back, that we're arguing with each other about fake news, their contributions to that, I think, have been a positive outcome for Putin and his definition of Russian foreign policy, right? And I want to emphasize that. It's his definition. It's not mine, or I, I would define Russian interests in a different way. Um, uh, but the second goal, which is to have a president in the White House that was going to be cooperative with Russia, they have not achieved that. You're absolutely right. Uh, I think in, in many ways it's worse today than it than was. it would have been under Hillary. Uh, maybe hard to say with uh, Secretary Clinton, but most certainly there have been, you know, there's a new sanctions law. Uh, lethal assistance now to Ukraine. Uh, both of those are new things that happened after Obama. And most certainly, there's been no breakthrough in U.S.-Russian relations. There's hardly anything going on. Now, how should the Americans counter what the Russians are doing in terms of American national security? I'm not talking Ukraine. I'm not talking Syria. I'm talking explicitly their capabilities and efforts against the United States. What should we be doing that we are not doing right now? Let's start with practical things that could happen before 2018, because the bigger debate will take longer. Uh, very concrete thing. For every vote that is cast, there needs to be a paper trail for that vote. So that in the event of a computer malfunction or an intervention or a sabotage, that we have a way to audit the vote. Uh, right now, there's a dozen states in America that do not have that. And that's just, to me, a no-brainer. We should just do that. Uh, that's the first thing. We need to get back to hanging chads. You know, we should just have simple backup. You know, even me, you know, when I write books, uh, maybe I'm old fashioned, but every now and then when I get to the end of a chapter, I print it out. Because uh, God knows what might happen to my computer and the cloud and, you know, just. And the Russians. Uh, I mean, absolutely. You know, yeah, just yeah. print it out, baby. Yeah. Just put it in the file just so you have it hard copy. On the media piece, it's harder, of course, because we have this this First Amendment thing. But I would say a couple of things there. One, Russians don't get First Amendment rights, right? They're not American citizens. And then two, I would say we should just replicate the basic rules that we have for television and for campaign uh, contributions that the Federal Election Commission does. 
that's got to be now on 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 all platforms, and and therefore you know in kind contributions to a campaign for a, a foreign government should not be legal for any foreign government for any foreign government ally antagonist doesn't matter yeah so what about tit for tat sort of thing so if the Americans um, turns, yeah. are, are are whacked by the Russians if an American NGO is shut down. Uh, and if, if an American media organization is shut down in Russia, should Russian media organizations be allowed to operate in the United States, in your view? Yes, I think they should, uh, with a couple of conditions. So uh, we used to debate this when I was in the government, and uh, I was always convinced by the argument, we're not them, let's not do to them what they do to us. Now, if you had access to President Trump right now, um, and you could have him do one thing, that would help improve the state of the U.S.-Russia relationship right now, carrot or stick, it would be what? I think the one thing he could do is just speak honestly about what happened in 2016. You think that would improve the state of the U.S.-Russia relations? Yes, and here's why. Because right now, there's hope. In fact, I just talked talk to some Russians downstairs, so uh, anecdotal evidence from an hour ago. There's, right now, there's a view in Moscow there's the good czar, right? That, this is a metaphor from the 19th century. That's Donald Trump. He's trying to do the good things in U.S.-Russian relations, and all of his minions are trying to block him. And so they're, they keep hoping that if they can just pull him out, you know, get him away from his national security team and Secretary Mattis and all these hardliners, they'll be able to improve relations. I think that's a false illusion. Uh, and therefore, to have the Trump administration with one foreign policy that's the first step before we get to cooperation. Mike McFall, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. That's your show this week. Be sure to tune in. Next week, we have President of Rwanda and head of the African Union, Paul Kagame. See you then. Music